Abney Park's Toy Shop at the End of the World. Chapter 3. Things that are not fair. Late into the night, the girls flipped and turned in their rag beds in the basement. Chloe's bed was made of what had once been old couch cushions, but now showed as much stuffing as upholstery. Bella's top bunk was a striped green and white sheet tied between rafters, hammock style, above Chloe's bed, and the two girls tossed and turned in their beds all night long. They had been so excited by their first view of the fabulous toys that there was no sleeping. That princess was so beautiful, Chloe exclaimed in a whisper. She was brave. She never stopped fighting. Next time we should let the princess wear the armor and sword, said Isabella. I don't think the knight could take the armor off. I'm not sure that knight was made of anything more than armor. He might just be empty inside. But still, the princess should have a sword. Do you think we can play with the circus and the knight at the same time? It would be fun to have the knight ride an elephant to fight the dragon. The elephant is too small. It would have looked like the knight was riding a baby elephant to war. <laughs> that would be wonderful still. Their talk went on like this for hours. Eventually, they fell asleep. When Bella woke, Chloe was not in her bed. She climbed out of her top bunk and onto Chloe's bed, then onto the much-swept, though never clean, black brick floor. She crept by memory to an exposed wall switch and flicked on the single bulb that dangled in the center of the room. Through a hallway, she saw the bed of her mother. Her mother's hand was clutching a tissue spotted with red. Through another doorway, she saw the kitchen, with the wood stove and sink and a stack of dishes they had washed the night before. On the counter in the kitchen was a familiar brown paper bag. Uncle James had brought food while we slept, Bella thought, and, remembering she had not eaten the night before, she ran to the kitchen. She pulled out a hard, dry loaf of bread, several cans of baked beans, a stick of butter, six eggs, a mostly unspoiled onion, and a bottle of pills. Isabella emptied out the bag, wadded it up, and put it in the stove. She then pulled several lumps of coal out of a tin bucket and put them on the top of the paper. She took matches and lit the paper, and while it sputtered and attempted to light the coal, she put butter in a rusty cast iron pan and put the pan on the stove. She then skipped out of the room, through the main room, and into a closet that had a dirt wall. Growing in the dirt were dozens of fat, dull white mushrooms. She picked four the size of her hand and sprinted back to the kitchen. Here, she cut the mushrooms in quarters with a dull knife and dropped them into the sizzling butter. She then took a slice off the onion, diced it, and dropped it into the butter, along with three eggs. She stirred the mix until the eggs turned opaque and fluffy, then grabbed the pan with a rag and scraped some of the omelet onto a tin plate. She took the plate and the fork and the bottle of pills and a glass of nearly clean water into her mother's bedroom. She now had the task of waking her mother long enough to get her to take the pills and eat some of the omelet before her mother fell back asleep. Later, she would help her mother use the bathroom. It was a heart-wrenching ritual, and each day mother would stay awake a little less and eat a little less, and Isabella would try to smile, but she would always end up crying a little afterward while cleaning up. Isabella was six. Isabella then took the cast iron pan and the remaining omelet and two forks and headed to the top of the stairs. In the dark, though she couldn't see her, Isabella was right to guess that Chloe was sitting there, trying to peer through the crack into the toy store. There was a jingle of the front doorbell, and though Bella was silent, Chloe said, Shh, here comes the children. It was Saturday, so the girls were giving themselves the day off. They sat all day listening to the children play. It was even more rewarding now because they knew the toys near the trap door and could imagine the games that were being played. The elephants will now do a dance, said a boy doing his best ringmaster voice. The girls imagined the elephants dancing, and when the boy and his sister laughed, Chloe and Isabella laughed with them. Oh, mother, I would do anything to have that tin knight, said another boy. And the girls made nervous little fists and held their breath for fear that their new friend would be sold before they had a chance to play with him again. Oh, I don't think that's tin, Billy, 
That looks like... Oh my, silver. Billy, I don't think Mommy could afford that. The girls exhaled and relaxed their grip. The girls sat at the top of the stairs in the darkness at the end of the day when the shop went quiet. And when the light at the crack of the door went dim, they pushed out again. There was no discussion this time. This was now a thing that they did. Again they saw the shiny dark wood floor and the polished cabinets, and they saw the silhouettes of cities and castles and dragons and airships poised in the darkness. Chloe went straight to the circus and snatched up an elephant, carefully detaching it from its gypsy vardu. As she turned, she saw the knight sitting headless and defeated in front of a sympathetic-looking dragon. On Isabella's shoulder sat the princess with sword, shield, and helmet, and Bella said, Let's take them somewhere to play. They passed a table where two foot-long pirate ships exchanged fire in a sea of slow-motion waves. They passed a massive field in miniature, where soldiers the size of thimbles now basked in the grass enjoying a much-needed rest to their battle. They passed red stone desert canyons, above which balloons and zeppelins and biplanes and triplanes swirled endlessly around like fish in an aquarium. Then they came to a cabinet containing nothing more but a wicker basket full of something that resembled ornate tea trays. I wonder what these do, said Chloe, gently setting down the miniature elephant. She pulled out one of the trays and saw that it was a teeny wall, ten inches tall and twelve inches wide. It contained wainscoting, wallpaper, multi-paned glass window complete with curtains, two wall sconces, and a teeny wall switch. She flipped the switch with her fingernail, and the lights came on. Oh, how pretty. I see what you do, Bella said, and she began pulling the walls out of the basket. Each wall magnetically linked to the other walls at the corners, and within minutes they had created a vast and sprawling Victorian manor, complete with running water, working stoves, electric lights, and a slide down the grand entry's main stair. The teeny princess watched the whole construction process, helmet in lap, while sitting atop the tummy of the sleeping elephant. As she watched, the princess clapped with joy. The house was exactly her size. Once the elephant and the princess had moved in, leaving the elephant in the front yard to serve as watchdog, they carried the headless knight over, along with several of the clowns. The knight stomped up to the princess, snatched back his helmet, and mumbled, How would you like it if I wore your head? The girls, leaving the toys to live in their new home, wandered deeper into the toy store. The furthest back wall was marked Workshop. The thought that this is the origin of all these amazements felt magical, and to visit such a place seemed mischievous. They opened the frosted glass door and peeked in. This room was not as pretty as the toy shop's main room. It had unpolished stone floors, and lining every bare wooden wall, were thousands of hand tools hung in rows of descending size. In the center of the workshop was a table, and on the table lay a massive figure, a shadow mountain, lying prone in a pile of broken toys. Is that the man they carried in last night? I'm not sure. Maybe, replied Chloe, but she was interrupted by the toy shop's front doorbell. The two little girls climbed under the table and hid. The two men they had seen the night before had walked into the shop, and they were talking in hushed voices. Chloe recognized the voice of Uncle James. He was a kind-hearted young man in his early thirties with brown, unruly hair and ice-blue eyes. I understand they can't stay here forever, Calvin, but where are they to go? Their mother is sick and cannot work for them. They have no father, and so there is no income to pay the taxes from their consumption points, James implored. James, replied the older man in a sympathetic but condescending tones. You are passionately misunderstanding me as you always do. I'm not saying they can't remain living in my basement. I'm saying they shouldn't. That's no life for a child, and it's probably aggravating their mother's sickness. Don't let your passions make decisions for you. They will typically make the wrong ones. This was the voice of Calvin Calgory, the toy master. If he was often condescending, he had a right to be. 
Calvin, though in his 50s, had the energy and curiosity of a 10-year-old, coupled with the knowledge of chemistry and clockworks and physics beyond anybody still alive. He had spent the last 25 years in forcible employment of the government, creating things he would rather forget, and as a reward for his service, he had been allowed to retire and open a toy shop, which he named Herr Drosselmeyer's Toys, after the character in the Nutcracker Ballet. But, Cal, James went on, there aren't any other options. Nobody knows the laws better than myself. If a family cannot earn enough consumption points, the family members are relocated. My sister and her children have no income, and if they are discovered, they will be split up and placed into families that don't want them to be another burden on their financial obligations. Is that what you think relocating means? That the children will simply be moved to other families? I wish that is what I thought it meant, Calgory said darkly. I see your point, but all the same, we need another plan. If the current system doesn't work for them, we need to step outside of the system. Cal, you know what that kind of talk leads to. You're implying life outside the city, which we all know isn't allowed. James was interrupted by a motion on the main work table. And how is this one? Does he have some parts worth salvaging? Well, Kelgori said, walking around the table, his gyros and rods are bent, so he can't walk. He can't keep his balance, but I should be able to straighten them out. It might make more sense to fix him than scrap him. But can you repair his mind? He attacked a bunch of his fellow prison guards with his branding iron. They say he shows signs of too much awareness. He was not following orders, he was making decisions for himself. Typically in the tower we just scrap machines that show signs of that kind of thing. Oh, James, don't be a fool like the rest of them. They complained for twenty years that my automatons were dim-witted. Honestly, I think they were just using them as scapegoats for their own mistakes. So I upgraded my automatons to be at least as intelligent as their masters, and now their masters outlaw the intelligent ones. They feel threatened. Only if they're too intelligent, Calvin. They're supposed to be machines, laborers. If they think independently, how can they work as part of a team? Once they appear to think like people, they become people in the minds of those watching. Then it looks like slavery. Ha! Everything about this city looks like slavery. Dr. Calgory, please don't put me in the position of having to report you. Please don't talk like that around me. James was looking worried. And he tried to get back on topic. But you're saying this one is broken? Knowing right from wrong is not broken. Right and wrong is subjective, Cal. If your machine doesn't have the same definition of right and wrong as our government, then it's broken and dangerous. James, you're a good man, but a stupid one. Calgory sighed, and he set his pliers on the workbench. Forgive me, but I'm tired. I will see you tomorrow night. Leave an old man to rest. James sighed and looked with pity at Calgory, who did indeed look old and tired. James would get no more conversation from Calgory tonight, so he turned in frustration and left the shop. The second he was gone, Calgory straightened up again and paced around the room, collecting various tools from the walls. He placed calipers, pliers, screwdrivers with bizarrely shaped tips, and tools too specific and varied to be described, in a tin bucket and he took them to the table in the center of the room. Calgory then began unscrewing metal plates from the sleeping giant's chest. As he did so, the girls heard a low, sad, scraping, metallic voice. I can't move, father. Why can't I move? This voice sent a shiver down Chloe and Isabella's little spines. It was so sad, so defeated. Don't be afraid. You fell a very long way, and much of your insides have been crushed. But if I can make you, I can fix you. Was, was I... was I wrong? The quiet but ominously low voice vibrated the toys on the table around him. Wrong about what? Was I wrong to defend that lady? She was scared. They were hurting all those people, and she was scared. I was supposed to hurt her too, but I did not know why, so I wouldn't. And so the other automatons pulled her from my arms, and pushed me from the tower's top. No, you were not wrong. They were wrong. You did the right thing. 
But sometimes doing the right thing hurts more than doing the wrong thing. Uh, that doesn't seem right, said the brass man. Well, it's not fair, if that's what you mean, but that's why it was right. The world does not come equipped with a mechanism for fairness built into it. That's what good people are for, to put the fairness in the world. But I am not people, said the brass man, in a voice that sounded like it was a painful thing to say. Yes, you are. You may not want to be, but you are. You are better people than they are. Sitting under the table now, the little girls, who barely understood this talk, could sense that they had something deeply in common with the brass giant on the table. Something was not fair to all three of them. Something so very not fair that none of them were supposed to exist at all. Bella and Chloe continued to hide under the table, while the toy maker fixed and talked with the mechanical giant. The hardest part of being a small child hiding is that you get bored, and when a child gets bored, she starts to play with just about anything around. It's instinct, and it's uncontrollable. Bella could see some of the broken toys hanging over the edge of the table, under which they had hid, and couldn't help herself. So slowly and quietly, she reached her teeny pink fingers up to the side of the table to grab a teeny doll. But before she could grasp it, the tips of her fingers touched it, and it rolled just out of reach. She frowned, but before she could be sad, the doll slid back into view. The giant had pushed it back to her. She took it, but was now too nervous to play with it. The giant must know we are here, she thought, and she looked at Chloe with guilt. Chloe only put her finger to her lips, her eyes wide with panic. They did not understand why they hid below the floors of the toy shop, only that there were consequences to being seen. They had some warning that the consequences would be dire, but they did not know who they were hiding from. Perhaps the brass man. Perhaps the toy maker. Well, that's all I can do tonight, my large friend. I'll be back in the morning and see if I can get more of your insides straightened out. Still, you should be able to move now. Thank you. You're welcome, said Calgory. Good night. And the doctor left the room by the spiral staircase in the corner, turning out the light as he left and locking the door at the top of the stairs behind him. The room was dark. All the girls could hear was the sound of the giant, the mechanisms in his exposed chest whirling quietly. Finally, it spoke in a grinding, rattling voice. Why do you hide? Chloe said, We're supposed to hide. Then after a pause, Why didn't you tell on us? Are you going to tell on us? No. None of you are doing what you were told to do. He paused. Then he went on. A person should not be in trouble for doing what they believe is the right thing. The girls were silent. They agreed with this, but they felt they didn't quite understand all that was being said. Can we go? asked Chloe. Why would you ask my permission? said the machine. Because you're a grown-up, said Chloe. Have you never met an automaton before? asked the machine. No. Well, we don't tell living people what to do. They tell us what to do. But we are kids. Kids don't tell grown-ups what to do. They ask what they're allowed to do, Isabella said. Have you never met a kid before? No, I have not. This was not exactly true, but the giant wished it was true, and all three were silent. Then the machine added, I am unaware of the protocol for automatons and children. Not here in this setting. He sounded worried. Perhaps we should keep this a secret until I find out what the rules are. Otherwise one or all of us might get into trouble. <laughs>